Okay. So I read over all the papers that had come in. Um, two of them came in very recently, but there were six from um, Lyon and two from AUW. And I think, <clears throat> I think that in your humanism last time, you gave pretty formal presentations and you did a good job. And a number of you, your papers are very similar. So uh, what I'm gonna just ask you to do, because we also have material to cover. So there's no need to do everything all over again in a formal presentation, because you all did well. Uh, but if you wanted to talk about, some of you wrote on a different topic. And if some of you want to just talk about your final takeaway, like what further thing you learned just by having to write that paper, then that would be, you know, that's, a, I would, I'll call on each of you to do that. But I also said, since I only suggested it earlier today or yesterday, you don't have to do it today. So you can do a pass today, or if it's fresh on your mind, you can just say, well, this is my final takeaway from my thoughts about practical wisdom, good governance, uh, humanism, and anti-humanism. So I'll just call on each of you and you can give your little thingy, except Liam, right? You don't want me to call it? Yeah, okay. Um, you can give your little two bits or not, you can pass. And then we'll start with Confucianism. Um, it is amazing to me because of course I teach this every semester, but oh my God, I just think this is, this is getting more and more relevant. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, it's not supposed to do that. Like old people aren't supposed to say things like, I always said that, you know, I never had to change my mind, but um, <laughs> there's some things, yes, but this particular issue that I think we're gonna talk about today, I think is really gonna play a big role in all of your lives as, as you take on leadership positions. Um, yeah, okay, so Kasturi, you don't have to present. Everyone can just pass. Yeah, I know that only two AUW students have done their papers. That's, I know that. So um, anyway, so we'll, I'll call on each of you if you want one last wrap up about your paper. And then we'll start with your first reaction to the reading today about Confuci Confucianism, Confucianism. And then we'll, you know, I'll go through some outlines and I'll talk about what really struck me this time, and then we'll move on. Um, given my uh, gift of gag, uh, not gag, <laughs> uh, gab, I uh, probably will be through the hour by then. Um, okay, so Samantha, is there some final, final thing you wanna say about your um, introduction to humanism or whatever. Yes, Professor. I thought it was very interesting. Um, humanism's change over time, but also the relationship between the foundation of our nation and other nations around the world and how humanism in a sense could stem from, you could see multiple stems from the Greeks. And I just found that all the big circle moment very interesting. Okay. And I'll be curious to know what Houston Smith said about Confucius and the U.S. founders, right? Yes. Okay, we will get there. Okay, good. I think also for somebody interested in history, this is intellectual history, right? And so putting those together, I'll be curious by the end of the semester, how much you think there's what they do and then there's what they're thinking, right? And how how you think those go together because a lot of history is taught without serious study of what they're thinking, right? Because philosophy is esoteric and nobody cares, right? Okay, good, Samantha. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold your feet, your head to the to the floor on that one, okay? Okay, Professor Beck. 
Um, I have had some really bright students in history really like studying the concepts before. So that's always, a, that's wonderful. I love that. Okay, Haley, what about you? Um, I think I would be more prepared if I went over it on Tuesday. Okay, we'll do it. Uh, Blaine. Hello. Um, I would not like to present my paper today. Okay. Um, please and thank you. Um, so are we just like, I, I just, so you said earlier, um, we're gonna like discuss what we thought about the reading with Confucius. Are That's you wanting each of us to do it like right now or are you gonna call no, everybody again? That'd be the second round. We're just okay. gonna do a quickie. Again, you don't have to do an official paper presentation type of thing. It, you know, if you did, you did a nice job on the previous humanism, scientific humanism, right? Um, so I, I won't grade these so much. I just want, you know, you to say publicly, what's my final takeaway from studying this section of the class? Um, uh, Jamie, do you have something to say about what you've read so far? No, Professor. Okay, so I know that, yeah, and you can stay after class if you want to talk to me about uh, where you're at or whatever. Um, Rossi, did you want to talk about? Sure. Um, sorry, I'm at a hospital, so I can't like, legally turn on my camera, but um, so my paper is about um, a humanistic leader, so I decided to about King Chayavaramandu VII. He's one of the greatest king in Cambodia. Just some background information on him. He um, ruled from 1181 to 1220. Um, he's ruled the Khmer Empire and spread the uh, Khmer Empire to its largest territorial extent during his reign. And so my essay, it examines the Aristotelian personal virtues, political virtues, and practical wisdom that King Chiyavaraman VII showed throughout his reign and how they portray his humanistic um, way of life. So I started off with um, his courage and how he was able to return home from Champa and also fight the war to uh, be able to unite the country back together and um, and like destroy foreign rule and the, Ch the Cham invasion so that um, Cambodia was able to restore its um, independence. And then um, I talk about the art of statecraft. And this is the art of weaving people together into a strong state and middle-class um, families, middle class. And so this is done through um, institutions where he knew that people were having religious war. So what he did was he um, reunited them by creating temples that are not dedicated to one particular religion. So there are examples of at um, Uncle Tom um, Bayun Temple and Tebrom Temple. So these temples, they um, have like structures that are incorporated from Hinduism, Buddhism, and Brahmanism. So um, they have like smiling images of the gods to symbolize this peace and um, like unity among the people. And also I go on to talk about how greed and the desire for excess wealth destroys society because um, it leads to the unraveling of the middle-class family. But um, Chayyavaraman VII was aware of this and he developed a way to maintain the middle-class family during his reign. So while previous kings um, led the Khmer Empire into war both internally and externally, um, King Chayyavaraman VII devoted his time to peace and stability where he created temples, um, roads, rest houses, institutions, hospitals. So everything to help make sure that the, uh, like the lifestyle of the people back then were improved. 
and then I also talk about a political virtue that he possessed, which was the um, rectification of the wrong. So during his reign, the king established a system of punishments for breaking the laws that were accepted by the public as something that's appropriate and applied equally, regardless of ranks or of religion. So he had a reputation for um, punishing citizens from every religion and social class equally. So depending on the circumstances for crimes such as adultery, theft, and disputes between family, the king ordered the wrongdoers to wait for either for a judgment from heaven or in more serious cases, he will send the disputants into a crocodile pool and whoever was wrong would be eaten. And then there were also evidence in the transcripts along the temple, like on the temple saying that he would uh, plunge a suspected thief's hand into a boiling oil with guilt for them to confirm their crimes. And so King Shoyavaraman VII valued justice and fairness. And this is what helps him to be able to control such a huge empire. And then we go on to look at Jayavaraman VII's practical wisdom of knowing the object of choice. It has become essential during his ruling because he knew that in order to unite the Khmer Empire, he needs to make the right choices at the right time. So he learned from previous kings about how being biased in one religion and disregarding the other leads to the destruction of the nation. So as I've said earlier, he built big temples and public places for like unity of all the religious groups to use together, but also he makes like, he builds like separate um, public places that each group can go. So. All, everyone feels valued and respected for their religion because they have a place to go. Whereas from previous kings, if that king was a uh, was a Hindu, that king will only build uh, like Hindu um, religious temples, and so they disregard um, Brahmanism or Hinduism, and that was what caused the um, discrimination. And so we have seen that Aristotle's personal virtues, political virtues, and practical wisdom were all present throughout King Jayavarman VII's life. And it has helped him to not only be able to control such a large um, landmass and a lot of people, but he was able to help maximize um, human flourishment and help them to grow. So we have seen that there are many Aristotelian virtues that leaders should possess to be effective and productive leaders who care about the social well-being of their citizens. So leaders who can understand the patterns of the virtues will be able to better analyze their behavior and find a common ground for development. And I feel like although leaders can have their ups and downs and they make mistakes, it's important for them to hone, hone their humanistic side and um, show their compassion and care for the citizens in order to unite the people and help them flourish. So that's my paper. Okay, so uh, if Rossi will let me do it, um, it's this kind of stuff that I really love about teaching at AUW, I learned so much about the history of all these countries. And so if it's okay with Rossi, I think I'll post her paper on both classrooms, if any of the rest of you are interested. But it's a thousand years ago, and it's learning how to identify those patterns, right? And then you can, it's just amazing because I mean, so much of education explains the differences. And I had such a hunger for trying to find patterns that I, I had to ignore most of my education. It was very frustrating. <laughs> so you guys might not like this approach and that's fine. I guarantee you not, it, the system doesn't reward it. So you don't have to follow it, but I know that I needed it. And so if it's okay with Rossi, I'll just post it and let other people think about that stuff. 
and think about the human condition and these patterns, these uh, patterns in human culture that emerge and then the virtues in relation to them so that that's a completely different kind of universality than like laws or um, uh, modern, the modern view of rationality is very different. Uh, is that okay with you, Rossi? Yes, Dr. Buck, it's okay. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, Destiny. Destiny? Greetings. Uh, I will pass. Okay. I must say, Destiny, on one of the posts I read, you were complimented. <laughs> One of the AUW students really admired you for all your thinking there. So I thank my unnamed admirer. <laughs> That's why I have you guys, you know, you're teaching each other. Um, okay, Giovanni. Um, so on my paper, I kind of had like a, a different spin. Like I didn't go for like a, the traditional like leaders that we all knew but I kind of like explained what I thought was like the ID leader and who, what that person should be. And I gave like an example of who that person was for me throughout my life. And that in my paper, that person was my coach, my first ever soccer coach. When he, he had us from kids, like it was our community back in my country. And we were like 10 year old kids. And it was like, for us, it was like an outlet, you know? And he had us for like, three, four years and like really developed us. And the, one of my, like in classes and like in other discussions, one of my main things was like being for everyone to be able to like have an opportunity to be equal, you know? And like, if it wasn't for him, like I wouldn't be where I am today. Like I was able to like leave and like come out here to get like a better education and, every, and stuff like that. And I just feel like if we have more honest people like that, that's like willing to do work, and just like put everything aside to just better everyone around them. Like it'll make just, I guess the world such a better place <laughs> because like he had all the qualities to, to like really develop us and help us to actually get further. So like for me and for like, I have friends that played on the same team with me back when I was that young, we're like the first people in our family or even like community, I would say to like leave and go out and like yeah. get a better education right. and, and play at like a higher level and stuff like that you know so that's kind of the gist of my paper actually my grandson is playing on a soccer team exactly like that um and they have these posters my my son has in his yard it says uh soccer for all and it has the um latino kids and african-american kids white kids um, and it costs a lot. It costs like three thousand bucks. But yeah, see, that's so. So, like for example, and that's like kind of like a difference because it's completely different. Like in my country, you know, it's like next to free. So, like people, they would go out of their way to make it free for like kids, especially you know, and like younger, like younger adults that's developing. Like you would get like the leaders. They would try to go out of their way to make that outlet like extremely i would say accessible to like kids you know like so i would say if they wanted to pursue that or like they had the drive to try to you know to do yeah, something actually the way the, the way they work it in the u.s this is predictable right they had there was one kid he's from the most elite private school in saint paul um it's called um spa anyway but then it's actually they have scholarships. And so some of the parents give scholarships, right? Or they find scholarship money from wealthy people. So every kid that, that qualifies does get the money. It's just that it goes through private donations, which is very typically American, right? To do it that way. I understand. Yeah, okay. Um, Anyway, yeah, that's nice story. I mean, I, I totally, you know, I'm on board with all that. I kids are not prejudiced, or you know, they just want to play, <laughs> and um, it's nice to get them 
to be able to do that as much as possible when they're young. Um, yeah, and, and a number of them will be first generation college, I'm sure. So that's great. Um, Kasturi. Yeah. Kasturi, do you, is there anything you want to say at this point? Uh, no, Professor, since I have not worked on my paper, I will be uh, talking about uh, Confucium and other parts in the second round. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's fine. Untari, did you want to talk about your paper? Um, professor, I might pass today. Okay, all right. Uh, Shamima, is there anything you wanted to say? I know that you've, uh, Shamima's had a terrible toothache. So um, do you want to pass today, Shamima? I think so. Um, is there anything you want to say, Shamima? OK, Aiden, go ahead. Aiden, he disappeared. Oh, there he is. Oh, he disappeared too. <laughs> okay, so second round is your thoughts about the reading for today about Confucianism. Um, Liam, did you read it? I have not read it. Okay. So, um, Samantha, go ahead. Yes, so there was a specific part in the reading that really caught my eye. Let me go to it real quick. Um, that's not it. Okay, it was this quote that really caught my eye and it said the man of noble mind has neither anxiety nor fear or searching within he finds no chronic chronic ill so why should he be anxious or why should he be afraid and that thought jumped out to me a lot because in my personal life I tumble and it's constantly a battle of what your mind wants to do versus what you know you're capable of with your body. And so that kind of just stood out to me, especially with the um, anxious part. Um, so that kind of jumped out to me. So when you're reading these Analects, did Aristotle's virtues start coming to mind? Yes, a lot. I was going through them and I'm like, oh yeah, they have a lot in common. <laughs> I know, it, you guys, I'm warning you, your eyeballs are gonna roll. It's good, really, we have to do this again. You could probably write these stories yourself, but okay, I'm gonna do it just to let you know it's there. And I have to act like I know something you don't know, right? Um, all right, so Samantha, what did you think when it said, if Confucius had uh, thought about the solution of the US founders to appeal to reason, he certainly would have rejected it. So when I was reading through that, I didn't get fully through it, um, to be completely honest with you, Professor okay. Beck. Okay. I can finish it and bring you back my thoughts tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I didn't nope. the uh, that, that'll work. Because um, I really want you guys, I'm, now I know enough about how you think that I am curious, right? Oh, what's Haley going to say about this? Or what's Samantha, right? I'm starting to to get to know you enough. Um, yeah, Aiden, go ahead. We lost you for a minute there. Okay, hey, sorry about that, Dr. Beck. My computer just froze, but um, for my paper- Your computer was anxious. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but for my, uh, my essay, my main message was um, how you should be humanistic, but how you should try to stay true to yourself while you're humanistic. And then I talked about a lot of things, but uh, my first example was how I'm the oldest brother and how um, my younger brothers, they look up to me and they look up to what I do. And so when I don't think about my words or my actions, um, like I use baseball as an example in high school, 
um, I let, like when I failed, I let it show and I let like my anger get the best of me. And I thought that that uh, just taught my youngest brother in particular, uh, Mitch, um, that it's okay to get mad and it's okay to show anger and it's okay to yell and it's okay to, I don't know, just throw things. But that's not the case. And I've learned um, like in college, I don't do that obviously. And um, I've learned that it's better to really think about your actions. Um, so I talked about that. And then I talked about, I guess, some political stuff that I won't get too into. But um, it's about how, like, some people think you should think a certain way. And uh, sometimes people will just conform with it. It's easier for them to do that. Um, but, and I mean, I think it is okay to do that because a lot of the times it doesn't really matter. Um, but if you can, and if you're able to, cause sometimes it really doesn't matter if you're able to stay true to yourself and tell how you really feel about things. I think it's just more beneficial in the long run. Um, it can show people that think you're the same way as you that um, it's okay to think that way. Um, not everyone has to think the same way. And just stuff like that. And then I talked about how I'm going to incorporate some humanism into my life. And then like last class, I talked about promoting it through environmental humanism. And in my paper, I talk about how living um, just more clean um, is more beneficial to the environment and to society. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Okay, so um, yeah. In this very politically polarized situation, um, in a way, you know, you're being true to yourself if you're being patient with complexity and ambiguity. Because um, I think if you follow the golden rule and you know that the conclusions you've come to are based on a lot of wading through complexity and ambiguity that you would respect the other person and assume that their position also, or if, I mean, a lot of times for me, it's the problem is that even if you think you're being fair, you are oversimplifying. Um, and the, I don't, you know, I know a lot of people in Minnesota and I know that they're oversimplifying because I lived in Arkansas for 25 years, right? And I know that it's a lot more complicated than that. So it was a blessing that I could really learn about that. So just for example, my daughter wrote for the Wall Street Journal for seven years. And this was during the Trump era or and the o obama so it was both of those and i just kept telling her look if the people at the journal really want to understand this they should send a reporter here to live here right live here for a couple months go to the church go to the go to these places go to the city council meetings and just get totally absorbed and then write about it, right? And so that you have empathy, so that you really understand what, what life looks like from uh, the point of view of someone in a small town in Arkansas. Does that make sense to you, Aiden? Yes, ma'am, of course it does. I don't know why people don't do that. It's, I don't think it occurs to them. First of all, how different the suppositions are, but second of all, how we have a common humanity underneath that, you know? And it's not rocket science, but it is humanistic. And I do hope all of you, humanism has died. I mean, a lot of you, gee, I never heard of this. And, you know, the founding fathers were all humanists. So I do think that just these ideas need to come back into the public square. Does that make sense, Aiden? Okay, that's that's the main thing is that, okay, here's some ideas. <laughs> now go ahead and pick on it, guys. Um, all right, so 
let's see, Liam, did you, oh, well, let's go with Aiden. Did you, what was your reaction to the Confucian reading? I didn't have a chance to read it. Okay. Um, all right. Liam, did you read it? Did I already ask you about that? You did already ask me and the answer was no. Okay. Um, let's see. So, okay. Blaine, what about you? Hello. Uh, I did have a chance to read it. Um, so the main thing, uh, it's the, it says 2021 comma Confucius comma quotes. So it's that one. It says, uh, B, Chun Tzu, the mature adult, and then part C. Like, I, I don't agree with him. It says, a scholar who is not brave will not inspire respect, and his learning will therefore lack stability. Whenever he says not brave, I'm, I take that as, like, not serious, like, just, like, grave, like, get a grave demeanor. Right, there's a, word, there's a word called gravitas. Have you heard that word? I believe so, yes. And the Greeks had a had a word. It's called spudaios, a serious person. But go ahead. Okay. So I I just I don't really agree with that because um, like take me for example. Uh, I'm like I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but like I my approach to science is not great. Um, I like my my high school where I graduated from is ASMSA in Hot Springs. In order to graduate from there, you have to present a science fair project. So I did my project, I presented. And one of the reasons, like I, I got first place in chemistry. Um, and one of the reasons so many people like, like they came up and like they enjoyed my project was because I wasn't great, I wasn't serious. Like I had like a, a fun, a happy demeanor. Like I was making analogies and comparisons they could relate to. Um, and like I was, Stooping to their level sounds like the wrong phrase, but like I was, I was putting myself in their shoes, kind of where they would be able to understand exactly what I was trying to say. So, actually, I, I think, Blaine, that's two very different things. One of them is the golden rule based on empathy, and one of them is stooping to their level, which is not empathy, right? Well, let's like that's why I said like it doesn't sound like the right phrase, but I don't know what phrase to use. But I just I I organized myself, my presentation, my project in a way that anyone who would who was to come up and look at it like and talk to me like they would instantly be able to know everything about my project. And the reason that worked and they like they respected like what I had done was because I wasn't serious, but, but it was because like I was relatable and I was enjoyable to listen to and to present. So I disagree with that part, Chun Tzu. Okay. Um, yeah, actually, and then, it, you know, Socrates. Yes, wait, uh, Destiny, or yeah, yeah, Destiny put in the chat. Yes, thank you. <laughs> meeting them in the middle right the good old mean between extremes okay uh and also um socrates uh, had a reputation for speaking simply and people are always surprised because it was compelling and um so he did have an ability to communicate with people right that did also involve keeping things simple um all right, uh, Jamie, do you have anything you wanna say about the reading for today? I guess not. Uh, Rossi, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Park. Um, so for me, I wanna talk a bit about um, the Smith um, one. And so Confucius reply that um, to one of the questions related to hatred. So he answers that answer hatred with justice and love with benevolence. So I feel like what um, it's on page 168, the one by Smith. So what I was thinking was that it's important to um, be able to at least do some of what um, Confucius was 
um, saying because when we are able to live a life full of kindness where we where we don't take revenge and we don't waste our time um, getting angry over like every mistake or every like thing that we disagree with, then we can use our time like for something better. Like we can use our time to promote happiness or do it to change the people who makes us angry. So I think that that's a good principle to have in life, to use our time wisely and don't just get mad over like everything. Like I feel like it's important to pick and choose and to be able to know what is best to do. Right. Words of wisdom. Pick your fights, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, there's a... <laughs> There's another expression for that, that I had a male friend say to me. And then after he said it, he went, oh, you're a woman. Like that doesn't work too well. He said, don't piss in the wind. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, well, I don't think I will. Uh, <laughs> don't just get angry at anybody, you know, because uh, it'll, yeah, <laughs> it'll come right back at you, you know. <laughs> But that was yeah. kind of funny. Um, pick your pick your fights is a better one. It's not gendered, right? Um, okay, that's good, Rossi. Thanks. Um, Destiny. I have no thoughts. My head is entirely empty. <laughs> that's rare for you. Uh, I liked um, the part in Confucius's Analects where uh, it was like, what is wisdom um, to devote oneself earnestly to the duty to humanity? I liked that. Okay. Good. Because I think that everyone has a responsibility to just be kind and good to others maybe i wouldn't say that i believe that there is an inherent debt that you owe society because i think people are valuable simply by existing and that you fulfill your obligation to society by existing within that society and it's not something that you do it's something that you don't do like you fulfill that obligation to humanity by not doing things that would destroy it. Right. Okay. Anyway, I liked that one. Okay, good. That's what I got. Um, all right, Giovanni. Uh, so I did not get a chance to read that one. Okay. I finally remembered the name of my uh, my grandson's team. It just blocked out, but it's the Black Hawks. How's that? And so <laughs> the Black Hawks. Yeah, and it, that's a cool you know, name. But it was it's just really um, something people believe in. They're committed to, and they know what's going on. And the parents, yeah. the parents on the sidelines. It's just very obvious that it's a good mix. Um, so, sometimes the, the parents be more into it than the kids that are playing <laughs> I, actually the parents on Emiliano's team are they aren't one of the ones that you know goes for blood or anything uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are some of those and yeah, they really are anyway yeah there's that whole yeah most a lot of you are in sports and yeah, there's the whole complaining about the coach thing. And the referee, everything. But I just know that I would never want to be a coach. I would be terrible because they have to make decisions all the time and they're getting judged all the time. And it's, but it really is practical wisdom, you know? Yeah, it really, it really is. is. It really is. Um, Kasturi. Um, professor, is uh, the noise disturbing? Because like people here, they are uh, preparing for 
the uh, upcoming festival so i might uh, i mean i might be surrounded with sounds from back one so uh, yeah so i went through the outlines um, regarding confucius and uh, when i went through it i uh, i kind of uh, found it uh, quite nice because like uh, uh, i went through some statements where it says that uh, confucius he uh, prioritized social emphasis meaning that uh, for him as a leader uh, the uh, uh, welfare of his people was really important but then <laughs> uh, when i remember our discussion on aristotle's virtue on uh, political virtues but we were uh, saying that uh, political leaders they are mostly concerned about their own uh, well-beings and benefits but then uh, Confucius, he was uh, a really good leader because he thought about uh, the welfare of people first. For him, uh, the common welfare of the uh, people was really important. He was democratic as he was concerned for the um, uh, common people at first. And the most important part that I liked about him after going through the uh, outlines is that uh, he was humble about his own abilities and accomplishments. So uh, I think that um, in order to become a good leader, uh, an individual should uh, be really humble in um, regards to what he does, uh, because like uh, as a leader, uh, he is the one uh, who is leading the entire nation. And uh, I, I believe that uh, a, a leader is the one who is a role model for each and every people in the nation. And it also states that um, in order to become a role model in the society that we live in, uh, uh, psychology is really important because I mean uh, in order to become a good person we need to have our psychological state in a good state right so uh, if uh, political leaders uh, they maintain their psychological state in a good manner then they can actually uh, become able to lead the nation uh, in a good path and also, I also went through the uh, uh, part about the uh, change makers. And uh, so I really love the part where it said that uh, in order to uh, in order to develop leadership in our uh, in our children from their younger age, it's important that we give them some important leading roles. Uh, we uh, we can assign them some task, uh, making them leaders, so that they can actually learn about uh, uh, change making procedures from their childhood. Uh, for instance, uh, as a child who grew up in an orphanage, uh, I was personally assigned uh, um, many important things in the orphanage because of which I think that I personally got to learn about leadership during my childhood. So uh, I learned about leadership uh, from the orphanage. Then I implemented the ideas about leadership in the school. And so I think that because of all of these stuffs, uh, I am a good leader, I have to say. That's all, <laughs> Professor. Good. That's good, Pistori. Um, yeah, I mean, stereotypes about orphans, yeah, they, you just never know, right? Um, yeah, a lot of them really have to grow up fast, but they do grow up fast, you know? So it's, it's nice to though, it's nice to have it from someone who's been there. Um, all right, so Untari, do you have anything? Uh, yes, Dr. Rick. Um, but I'm not going to react about the Confucian, Confucianism because I think the realist system is what caught my attention the most. Is like, what? Because a realist, Realist system. Oh, okay. Yeah. When I read about the realist, 
I thought it would be the seat of dictatorship. Um, and I agree that realist expectation on the human nature seems so low until it makes them think that human need to be punished or rewarded to behave. I mean, that makes sense, you know, in all of our life, we are told that we have to be good or we aren't going to heaven and going to hell instead. However, it sounds so controlling. Does that make sense, Professor? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and on the other hand, the Mohi system, if I'm not wrong. Maoist. Uh, yeah. Uh, where they propose universal love as a solution to solve China's social problem, it feels like he is suggesting an utopian society. Because in my view, we cannot control others' emotion, let alone love, as he proposed, right? And for the Confucianism, I'm not really familiar with it, but there is Confucianism in Indonesia. Um, but for me, it feels more like a teaching ethics rather than religion. Yeah, okay. Um, like Confucianism teaching us about like how to live a life and how to maintain a family and a community in a proper way. And it's more like it's teaching us about applying human fear to in life particularly. Or am I misunderstood, Professor? Or no, is that... it actually religion? No, no, toward the end of the chapter, he that's he brings that up. Oh. Isn't it? Yeah, so that the it's gonna come up. It's uh, there's a couple pages. One of the sub headings is a religion or an ethic question, right? Oh so yeah, that, because it feels more like a teaching ethics rather than a religion. Right. So the I mean the argument that it would be a religion would be that it's about serious questions and also it has the great harmony, right? Like mm -hmm. the universe is harmonized. But um other people just think it's mostly about relationships. It's not there's no supernatural, you know, there's no real transcendence that even harmony is really natural. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It's more close to humanism if I can. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay. So Shamima, did you want to say anything? I guess not. Okay, Haley. Um, the thing that stuck out to me was that when they said um, strict punishment does not influence day-to-day -day interactions and morality. So I kind of had a question. Um, if we were more focused on rehabilitation than punishment, uh, would we see better results and would that be a Confucian way of thinking? Okay, um, I think so, but let's see. Well, you know, that's an ambiguous question. Depends upon the um, context, right? So, yeah. um, Okay, I'm trying to think of, okay. So in the documents about governing, um, especially when you add Lao Tzu, um, it says it's best to govern like you um, govern like water, just stay in the background and let things flow. So it's a very non-authoritarian model, except that there's also this desire for the great harmony. So what do you do if somebody doesn't want to be part of the harmony? <laughs> right, Haley? Right. Yeah, well, that's always a problem. Um, so, so I want you to keep that question in mind though. And we'll see, they definitely don't have the death penalty, I don't think, right? Uh, but they have, you know, they'll imprison people for things that we wouldn't imprison. So that's where I just like, I don't think I want to touch that one at the moment. Okay. Um, but it's something to keep in mind because it's important. So, all right, guys, I for next time, it's a lot of reading, but I do want you to read the text. And um, I hope all the Lion students have the book. And if you don't have the book, you have to confess to me in an email 
and then I'll send you the Xerox. But I mean, it's against the law for me to keep sending these Xeroxes. Um, so I hope you have the book or get it really quickly. It doesn't cost much money. You can get it used. I think get it for seven bucks or something, including shipping. So please. Um, but I do want you to read it for next time for sure. And I did want, you know, I said, I said in the post, you know, I want you to read page so and so to so and so. Um, so it it seems like some of you read one of the other um, attachments, which include quotes, but that's all right. Let's just go through this because. I do want to tell you why I think it's incredibly important for all of you uh, post-COVID, okay? So again, if you have historical perspective on things, 50 years ago, and I know I say this, but I don't, there's no good old days. There's, I'm not saying it for that, those reasons. It's just 50 years ago in the US, anybody with a brain knew that the World War II Europe was the most, was the most, was the wealthiest, right? They had had colonialism and all this stuff, but their economy collapsed in World War II. So the US was going to be the economic superpower we could have made a lot of mistakes, which we did, but we're still gonna, you know, we're still gonna be number one economically for a while, <laughs> okay? Then you could predict it, it's history, that Europe would come back economically and that the developing countries would start developing and that they would push off colonialism, right? They would resist it, but especially people knew that China was going to rise, right? Okay, so they knew that. They also knew that the climate crisis, if we do, didn't do anything, was going to get worse and worse and worse, and we didn't do anything, okay? Jimmy Carter said we should get off oil or it's just going to be awful. The Mideast is going to be a mess. We're going to invest all this money. It's not going to pay off. Okay, we didn't do it. All right. And this is another thing is that human affairs are not just one thing after another, okay? You can step back and figure some stuff out. So um, let's see. So there's going to be this economics are going to change. Technology is going to change things. Jobs are either going to have to change or people just aren't going to be able to get jobs. And there's going to have to be some reworking of economic systems to be green and to account for technology, whatever. We were going to have to educate our people to a higher level so that we could create products that required education and then people would want these products. Okay. Well, now all this stuff has happened, right? And um, in all of your countries since COVID, there has been a level of social chaos or collapse that isn't as serious as China, but I think in terms of studying the dynamics, and there are analogies, right? And then the other thing is that the last, uh, you know, last week we talked about humanism versus anti-humanism, right? And I've always said, you know, Aristotle thought children aren't born either virtuous or vicious, but they have the capacity for either one and a culture can nurture, right? Educate kids to want to be virtuous or it can pit people, right? Parents can beat up on their kids. Their kids think that people are untrustworthy and violent. I mean, I've had students whose parents tell them you can't trust anybody, right? And so if people are by nature untrustworthy, 
Well, then you need a strong man, right? They aren't going to create any kind of order. You just need an absolute uh, tyrant on the top to maintain order. And that's how people will be happy. Um, on the other hand, if people naturally are virtuous and love each other, you don't need leaders at all. And of course, Aristotle, they aren't either. It really depends on how the culture absorbs, you know, transforms their capacities to something creative or something destructive. Plus, it's constant. Like, you might be going along okay, and all of a sudden something hits, like COVID or a climate crisis. So how are you going to deal with social collapse? So I think all of you for the rest of your life are going to be in a lot of situations of disruption. And there are going to be a lot of people who um, overreact. There are going to be people who think our country needs a strong man just to maintain order. And there are going to be people who say, no, no, we can be humanists. <laughs> let's, have, let's be pacifists, whatever. But I think the person with practical judgment has to figure out how can we weave people together to prevent unnecessary disruption and, and violence and resentment and lack of trust, but without you know, being too idealistic. Like what's, it's, it's unrealistic to assume people always be good and it's unrealistic to assume they always be bad. It's like being good at statecraft means weaving people together, working together, right? And so this is really, really, you are going to be tested on this way more than I was ever tested on it. And I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but all I tell my students is, well, somebody has to lead. Like if you don't lead in this direction of liberal education, a liberally minded person, somebody else will take over, right? And they'll either be authoritarian and or they'll and or incompetent and or I mean it will be worse. So if you get discouraged, I would say just remember it could always be worse <laughs> and somebody has to lead. Um, so uh, this one was left over from the Greeks. Um, and I will say that the, the political situation that Aristotle, um, his word for it was called pluralism. He said, a society is not a unity, it's a plurality. And that's what all those Olympian gods, right? They had, they love justice and they love the wilderness and they love truth, reason, and they love beauty and these things would conflict. And so the state, the statecraft is weaving people together who are different in their sacred passions, but they have a common humanity and they can act as citizens and deliberate with each other and maintain a middle class. But maintaining a middle class doesn't mean grinding everybody down to be the same. So it's, it's uh, pluralistic. Um, and Aristotle is critical of somebody who thinks unity is the number one goal, okay? Well, Confucius, because he arose during this time of complete collapse, right? That people would um, boil, the conquered were boiled to death and the relatives are forced to eat it, right? I mean, that's about as low as you can go. <laughs> and so, there was this period of warring states. So how are you gonna recover? Um, again, I think all of you are probably going to live through more than one time when there are collapses, they aren't this bad, right? So you can say, okay, we're having a Confucian China's moment, but it's not that bad. So if Confucius could, could think of some creative way to restructure things and get things going positively. I sure can do that because it's not this bad, okay? So what are the options? 
there will definitely be people in every one of your countries who are the realists, the use of force, right? There will be people who want to use force. Um, and, you know, learning from history, does it work? Well, people, if it's bad enough, they will want the strong man, but after a while, they might not want that, right? Wait a sec, you were supposed to make me happier. And, you know, I don't like getting told this and that and that and that. Um, so it, 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 usually it doesn't last very long. It's not a very permanent solution. And it's too cynical, right? You can trust people sometimes and people will do the good thing and people will respond through their own choice, not always by force. Um, then on the other hand, we're the uh, all you need is love types, right? Or Jesus, you know, when Jesus says, oh, just forgive seven times, 70 times, no problem. Um, I, you know, I don't think, Anyway, that's why I like the union of Christianity and um, the Greeks. But whatever, um, the Maoists, that's the other extreme. There always are some people like this. My father-in-law was a pacifist, uh, but I, I'm not a pacifist, although I think most wars are really unnecessary. Um, that doesn't mean you should have a rule where you never go to war, right? There are times. So everything to me is a judgment call in the last analysis. You can't have an absolute rule. You have to have what's best in the situation. But anyway, so um, you do have to also, a good leader will focus on cultivating empathy, right? Just the golden rule, just uh, realizing that person has a common humanity. Um, all right. Uh, so Confucius thought that, no, this is too idealistic, right? Too utopian. Okay. Then there's the US founding fathers, which um, again, I have you reading something by them for next time. And I do, I'm very curious especially, of course, the American students. But I mean, if the AUW students want to comment on, it's great. But I, I like where Rossi took it and applied it to her country and her country's history. And um, I do apologize if this particular section, there's a few points here that are kind of Western, you know, that the US was founded on humanism. But on the other hand, I think maybe the students at AUW, maybe that's interesting to them because it's, you know, that what they see in the news every day about the US. And so just trying to find out something about the roots is good because the US has so much influence on things, not because all of the rest of you, your countries are very interesting. Uh, but for a lot of the Southeast Asian students, the history of China is particularly important because China has a huge influence in Southeast Asia. So that's, um, so this is where we sort of compare and contrast these two societies. Now, so I said in the, a week ago or so that the US founders were enlightenment thinkers. They were humanists. The Declaration of Independence is a very carefully thought out scientific proof based on facts that the, the King of England is a tyrant and therefore it's legitimate to declare war on him, right? But it's based on scientific evidence. Um, so, so that's number one is that you do need to know that the founders were religious heretics and completely pro-science, their view of God changed to fit the science. They were humanists. They, they also um, were very tolerant of different religious traditions. So they did focus on reason. When you have, when you go to the town hall meeting 
and you are, are figuring out when you're acting like a citizen, you base everything on reason and on arguments and on facts. So the Declaration of Independence is the model for the kind of deliberation you do when you go to the town square, when, you, when you're acting like a citizen. At your church, you can do whatever you want, right? But here, you have to work together and have a common humanity. All right. And Confucius is saying, no, that's not realistic. And um, Mr. Smith, the reason I like Houston Smith is I think he really loves all of them. And also, I think he's fair, although, you know, any student who wants to think he's being unfair because they have more knowledge than I do, that's great. I know that he was a missionary. His dad was a missionary to China uh, way back when there were very few Americans in China. So he knows something, but still. Um, all right, so the West's approach to the problem through the cultivation of reason is, you know, that's a fair understanding of what the founders were up to. And it'd be very hard to, to, to think that at this point because it isn't driving a lot of what goes on right now, but it didn't occur to Confucius or he would have disagreed because we are cultural beings, right? We develop, children develop in this context of attitudes, emotions, role models, and that's what Aristotle understood, right? Character starts when you're young. Um, okay, but that's why, again, our founders cared about education, liberal education. Um, but anyway, so Confucius response. This is, this is what, again, I want you to think about this. Deliberate tradition. So he rejects force, he rejects love, and he rejects reason. But it's tradition, but he literally structures tradition from nothing. He creates a tradition, which is a contradiction, right? A tradition is just what's handed down, right? It's not something you create. Um, but this is what he decided that China needed. And this, the next point is really interesting. And I, I want each of you to think about this too for next time. Do people in your country, do your grandparents or do your leaders or do other people, do they start talking about the good old days, right? I mean, I hear people talking about the good old days, right? It's a completely distorted view of the, good, of the old days, but no woman in philosophy should ever talk about the good old days when women couldn't be philosophers. Oh yeah, that was great. I mean, <laughs> I'm not deceived, but I think it's a psychological regress. It's a drive back into infantilism. You don't wanna deal with the complexity of life. It's too complicated as an adult, you know, as a kid, you believed in certain things and you also, you didn't know what was going on. So if you're well raised, you're raised around people who are trustworthy. You're raised around people who do are virtuous. And so you, you have to live in a bubble when you're little, if you're going to have character development, if you're gonna to learn to love virtue, you've gotta be around people who love virtue, but eventually you have to realize, oh, not everybody's like that. And then you have to deal with the complexity. And sometimes when the complexity gets to be too much, people, you know, recreate. Well, in the good old days, people weren't like this and it's, they were like that. You were just protected. So I do find it ironic when I live in the South and people talk about the good old days, like the good old days of slavery, or what is this? But I do have students whose grandparents really talk about the good old days of Jim Crow because everybody knew their place and things were ordered. And it's just, that isn't the good old days, guys, right? I mean, Black Lives Matter and all this stuff, it's messy, it's complicated. 
but I would not trade it for Jim Crow. Um, there's a price you pay, which is you cripple uh, African Americans, right? They didn't have an equal opportunity. So, but Confucius was a master genius. Like he is sort of history's number one social genius. He had an impact on, I think, three quarters of the world's population for like a thousand years. I mean, it's huge what he did or that tradition. Um, so he decided he would create this story about China back in the golden age. And so think about what he had to do psychologically. So this is true because story about psychology. He had, to, he had to invent this time before the time of the warring states. It was a golden age, the age of the great harmony. And so he had to give people a sense that Chinese people are dignified, right? As opposed to what I'm observing, okay? Oh no, Chinese people are dignified. So instead of trying to refer to the future, we can be better than that. He referred to the past. We were better than that. Like we have that right in our DNA. We have that deeply embedded in our psyche was the good old days, the age of the great harmony. Um, he, this was not a literal return to the past, right? Uh, one, two, skip a few, you know? It's, it's a story. It's idealized and it's romanticized, but uh, to fit his own time, right? This was the way to control behavior, to get people to do what you want them to do. Um, and people understood that, but they wanted it, right? They wanted to believe that we are better than that. Not that we could be, we are better than that. Um, so um, he shifted tradition. Okay, and then I, I, I'll give another example. Um, so, I don't know, when my oldest kid was maybe third grade or something, she came home with straight A's, right? And then I, I said, well, let's go out and celebrate and have ice cream sundaes or something. Well, we do it once and guess what? It's a tradition. <laughs> but mom, we always do that. No, we did it once. Well, that's okay. Okay, but anyway, that's the idea is that the Chinese people saw what he was doing and they wanted it. You know, they understood, yeah, this, this is it. And so he had an intuitive sense for how to be a leader, right? How to appeal, what to say. Um, he was being creative. So statecraft is a very creative activity. Living is a very creative activity. You're creating your life. So what kind of life do I want to be? Do I want to be a mediator or do I want to, just regress and, and uh, go to bed in fetal position and just say, I don't want to deal with it. Or do I want to like lash out and try and control? Like what part am I going to play in the human drama, right? Um, and he just, this was his, this is his legacy uh, to be a model of being a social genius. And all aspects of life were controlled. Um, and it says, yeah, this is the thing that I have, I think I have it in one of the paper topics. And lots of my students at Lyon, this is what they want to write about because their parents assumed human beings are by nature, they want to do what's bad, a doctrine of original sin in Christianity. Although Jesus said, I have come that you have life and have it abundantly. So uh, you don't, that isn't necessarily the only way to read the Bible, but it doesn't matter. It's the way their parents did, right? Um, Adam and Eve and we're born with the sin of Adam, whatever. So we have that. And a lot of kids at Lyon are raised with that assumption. And um, on the other hand, what would happen if you were raised saying human beings are by nature good, right? And kids from when they're tiny, that's it. 
Um, how much difference would that make? And then the question is, how would you like to raise your children? How were you raised? And just, you know, let, let yourself think freely about that question. Because that's, that again, goes back to that thing. We're not born good or evil, but we have a capacity to become one or the other. And culture really affects that right? Because we learn by what we observe. If you just, if you know a little kid, right? I mean, literally they'll fall down and they'll look at their mother to find out if they got hurt. <laughs> I've, you know, the responsibility as a parent is unbelievable. You know, you say, oh, you didn't get hurt, you know, or some other mother would say, oh, poor you. And I'm telling you, it's molding the kid's character. And it's obvious that it is. So, um, so that's a big responsibility, but culture is what people agree on certain things. They imitate each other. They look at each other. They compare stories. And that's why you can have a culture change um, uh, so quickly. And that's why Confucius was such a genius was that he, um, he was able to maintain this weaving together that lasted right? Um, I would say history will say in the U.S. that after 9-11, the social fabric in the U.S. started to unravel, and um, it's, still, it's still unraveling, but students in your, your generation are definitely going to have to deal with this, and I hope that you can weave, weave us back together, but that will definitely be a major task of your life that you'll be in the middle of. Um, all right, so then there was his life story. And next time, you really do have to read it. And then I, we will go to that chart of Aristotle's virtues. And we've already done Socrates, and now we'll do Confucius, right? Was he temperate? Was he courageous? He spoke up to the leaders. Um, he spoke truth to power, right? Was he, he was Socratic, he asked questions, he knew himself, he was humble, he was simple, um, he wasn't extravagant, he didn't get angry, right? Um, it's just, again, it, it's kind of like, oh my God, not this again. And the other thing about it is, okay, the, the Analects were written, I think, 70 years after Confucius was dead. I'm not quite sure if it's 70 because I know the books, the um, Gospels were also written about, you know, I think it was something like 70 years after Jesus died. So these books were not written right away. They're just stories. So the people who wrote wisdom literature they're not obsessed with getting the facts correct. They deliberately mythologize a person's life, which doesn't mean they tell lies. It means that they pick the stories that represent these basic virtues, or they make up a story, but it's the story of the kind of thing Confucius would have done, the kind of disciple he had, the way he would have talked to this kind of disciple and the way he would have talked to that one or the way the story is that he had a, a, a disciple that was kind of um, tended to be angry and this is what Confucius said to him. And so they'll make up a character, you know, name him something and then have a story about Confucius doing that. So in the wisdom literature, there's no problem with that. As a matter of fact, that's what's education. Education, if you're wise, you can write stories that'll educate people because they'll see the analogy, because you have gotten it to that level of the type of person and the type of situation. And, and that's, um, that's, that's the gift of the poet or the gift of the wise person is that they do that. Whereas a scribe, somebody who just 
obsesses about the facts, like you don't have to have a brain to do that. You just have to have eyeballs, you know? That's nothing. Everybody has eyeballs, but not everybody can figure out the stories that fit with patterns and a way of life. And so that's, Confucius Analects are like that. But I mean, I think the gospels are like that. Although there's obsessive, you know, tons of literature, what was this a fact or that a fact or whatever. Um, and I do want to say that, that the person who wrote the story of Adam and Eve, or it was probably just a story told and not written down for a long, long time. But when it finally got written down, and again, it probably got written down many different times before it came to the, I mean, we have different translations, right? <laughs> well, anyway, um, they would be totally insulted if you thought it was history or a fact, because they would say, I'm not a scribe, I'm not an idiot. Of course it's a myth because it tells truth. It tells about patterns. Um, and that's how far we've gotten from really understanding our holy books because we impose a modern enlightenment criteria of truth. Oh, it has to be facts onto the Bible. And the Bible was not written by people for whom that was the number one priority. Okay, so um, he was, he teaches, he was, had democratic instincts, a sense of mission. And, and Socrates had that, Jesus had that. Um, they had disciples. Um, Jesus talked back to the religious authorities and um, Confucius talk, spoke truth to power. Socrates spoke truth to power, got in trouble, uh, returned home. Um, he edited the classics, right? And then after him was when the Analects were written. Um, okay. So I have these, and then on another handout, I, I literally typed up a lot of this stuff, but here's the uh, five relationships. And I know that my students at AUW, some of them are raised in families where the elder sibling has a duty to the younger one. And it sounds like Aiden um, also, either he did or he took that on, so that goes on a lot. I mean, I think the language in the West, in the, in the US, we talk about freedom, equality, rights, blah, blah. But actually we grow up in families and we grow up in communities and we identify with you know this and that. We have our sports teams and it's these communities that are actually molding our characters. So, um, so trying to be honest about what life really is like and how much relationships matter. Um, and I mean, the main, the really interesting thing is you're reading for next time about the founding fathers is that they knew that and they really liked Confucius. <laughs> so I didn't know that. I had a student write a paper on that. And so, but they didn't want to call it Confucius, right? But they called it, they, they would start ethical communities like Thomas. Um, they wanted these little virtue clubs where they would cultivate these virtues. And a lot of them they got from reading Confucius Analects. Um, so they really understood this whole thing about character development that they got from Aristotle, they got from Confucius. But it wasn't what they said. What they said was enlightenment ideology because they wanted to present that it's going to be for the first time a constitution based on the rule of law and um, you know all those other enlightenment things, which are also really good. It's just that they're, they need this other stuff uh, to support them. Um, his character, uh, we'll talk about that. Um, and then how he governed, the importance of culture, um, the idea that a good president would enjoy poetry. <laughs> I don't think that the American people ask, well, does he like poetry or not? I'm not going to vote for him unless he likes poetry. I mean, that, that 
you know, we don't usually worry about that. Um, let's see. And then the notion of the self. So down here, for whoever was wondering, there is a whole little section on, is it a religion or an ethic? Um, its impact on human history is huge, more than a political or military, right? That's short lived. Uh, but the impact of Confucius was amazing. 2000 years over one fourth of the population. Um, yeah. So then the next thing that I, I, I'm going to bring up next time, um, whoops, I have, I added a document um, from what I had there before. I added it right at the last minute here, but um, so next time, I will ask you, I think, at the beginning to react to, to something you read from the Houston Smith book. Um, and these are the Analects. And a couple of you were referring to those. Uh, he who transfers his mind from feminine allurement. <laughs> of course, that's temperance, right? In uh, eating, drinking, and sex. Um, Here's the golden rule. I think that's pretty amazing. Um, so the first day of class, I know when I'm in the classroom, I don't think I said it here in this class, but I always start and say, if Jesus says the golden rule, and if Confucius says the golden rule, is it true if Jesus says it and false if Confucius says it? Um, and the average sophomore in college really has a hard time <laughs> thinking that. Although, you know, a lot of my students were taught that, that it's somehow different if Jesus said it. Um, but, and I don't, you know, I can't change anybody's mind. Um, so they work that out in their own mind. Um, and... I don't know, there's a lot of really interesting things here. And I hope each of you find something. Here's the news stuff. Okay, so I, I have five more minutes. And this is long, so of course you don't have to read it. But what I want you to get out of are two days on Confucius. Uh, another thing to get out of it, first of all, he has this, he has, his ethic is about different phases of life. And again, the West has this equality and freedom and rights. It never accounts for stages in life, but people do, right? <laughs> Obviously a child doesn't have the same rights as a parent. Um, th these things, children and parent relationships are not at all equal. And so you have to rule for the sake of the ruled. So those ideas are abstractions, they're ideologies. Um, they don't really describe human beings very well. And that's where the wisdom traditions are helpful. And our founding fathers knew that. So this is one at different phases. Uh, at 40, I no longer suffered from perplexity. So, in the US, the standard stereotype is, oh, that's the midlife crisis. And, and for Confucius, that's the midlife coming together where you start to synthesize, you know, your life starts coming together. But in the West, the stereotype is that that's when it falls apart. So I think that's unfortunate. Um, all right. Ah, this is a, an article about good leadership and they're willing to delay gratification. They can tolerate. I mean, this guy makes um, millions of bucks. You know, this guy makes a lot of money um, talking about emotional intelligence and publishing these books. And it's just like, wait a sec. How come I don't make all that much money? I'm just teaching the classics. And, <laughs> you know, it's annoying. So um, you, can, you can think about which of Aristotle's virtues are represented here. They're judiciously courageous. How's that? 
uh, they're controlling their egos, they're humble. Uh, anyway, so that's, that's something. Uh, this is George Washington, Rules of Civility. Just um, this one, it, okay. So another thing I want you to think about is that uh, the West, even at its best, its goal is to have a pluralistic society. So whether you want to call it Aristotle's kind of pluralism with the Greek gods and goddesses and these different passions and balancing, you have to balance them out, but people are different, but each thing is important. Or the Confucian one is much more harmony, the great harmony, working together and because of the background, right? The background was a huge collapse and there've always been many, many people and they've been very poor. And so you can say that uh, China always needed a more authoritarian type of government just in order to avoid collapse again. And also um, it would be compelling to people to, they, it would motivate them because they have um, poverty, they, they're threatened more than like an American. Uh, but anyway, so, so the new ruler does refer a lot to Confucius. Also, um, Mao Zedong under communism, he made himself into a Confucius type of person and he had his little red book and it had its little analex in it. So he understands, right? The Chinese psyche and um, all of that. So the thing, there are interesting things here about um, comparing it to, um, he's going back from Mar Karl Marx, he's linking it back to Confucianism. So you should be able to understand what this news article is about at this point. Okay, so then recently, more recently, in the last few years, he's become a strong man, right? He's made himself emperor. So, and that's happening around the world. A lot of countries are becoming more authoritarian. So it's very important that all of you understand that, that you're stepping into history. From college on, you have to be a part, very much a part of public history. Um, so, um, you know, I would suggest that you look that over. And then um, on the other side of it are some articles about a Confucian constitution. And then there was a editorial, uh, what year was this, 09? And this is interesting because it's saying, uh, here's the ideas behind China's success. Every one of them, is kind of a dig at, well, truth from facts. You know, they're saying you can't outdo us in your empiricism and your science, right? But a lot of them are um, digs at the West, especially at America. And so I do think you should think, okay, you know, here's the, the good, the bad, you know, trying to balance it out, just, for your own intellectual exercise and also to be better at political thinking um, is that they, they, he finds all of our weak spots, but he's arguing for a more authoritarian society. Now, Aristotle would say some societies at some time flourish better under more authoritarianism, but I don't think the US would. Uh, but there are going to come arguments. Um, our country, I, I did talk to a friend this, this afternoon and I asked him, do you think we're going to have a free and fair election in 2024? And he said, no. <laughs> it's like, uh. So the point is that these are open questions and you have to engage, right? You have to become part of it. You can't avoid it. There's a very, you know, this is a critical moment in history. Um, we're not just talking theoretically, but there are pros and cons. Everything is complex. 
Now there's no way, Jose, that Dr. Beck would like a confused, you know, a Chinese type of system because the philosophers <laughs> are always the first to go, guys. But on the other hand, you have to be fair. Being fair is more important than just um, than just saying ah, anything just so I can have my intellectual freedom. It's always a problem. It's always at stake. And um, I hope, you know, that I've tried to be fair to the Chinese because there's just going to be a big, there's going to be a lot of stuff between China and Southeast Asia, China and the U.S. And we need to understand from their point of view that they think they have a very good moral fiber, right? Anyway, I'll let you go. I'm late, a couple of minutes. If anybody wants to stay over to ask various questions, that's fine. And then I'll see you. There's quite a bit of reading for next time. I'm sorry. Um,